free open source software may not be known by name, but indirectly, anyone who sends an email or uses the web is using open source all the time as the gears of the internet. Web servers, mail transports, and FTP servers are nearly all open source. Although Richard Stallman meant free as in freedom, not free as in no costs involved, it was misleading. Not everyone understood the concept. Especially, as we'll discover, open source can have significant costs down the line. In 1998, the Open Source Initiative, an organization dedicated to promoting free and open source software, was founded by computer programmers Eric Raymond and Bruce Perrins, who felt that the word free could be replaced by open, and that would avoid confusion. Open source takes free software and promotes it to business people. When you say free, it doesn't mean freedom, it means cheap, and that didn't play too well to business people. So by rebranding free software as open, Bruce Perrins and his colleagues hoped that a new business model would emerge. And companies like Fortune 500 Computer Hardware and software developer Sun Microsystems are now making money by selling services instead of software. What we're actually doing is we are selling our skill in producing the software that people have installed. So actually we're selling exactly the same thing we used to sell when we sold glossy boxes that people paid for at the point of selection. But the proprietary software companies argue that customers want simpler solutions out of the box. Most of the customers that I talk to uh, are looking to reduce the amount of money they spend on services. They want software to be automated, to become more simple, to be, become less complex to run. So does that mean free open source software is being hyped unjustifiably? Not necessarily, because if you live in a country with a huge potential pool of software engineers whose charges are modest, the lure of software that does not incur the cost of servicing is less obvious. It's not 100% certain that open source is truly less expensive than proprietary software, but certainly initially it is. And a quick scan of the pricing of, say, Microsoft products versus Linux products, it's simple, it's no contest. Open source is much less expensive. For that reason, if we're going to bring the world online, the one, next one billion people, clearly it's going to take open source software, or certainly a different pricing strategy by the proprietary software vendors. There are 500 million people on the African continent under 25. In sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa, 98% of African schoolchildren go through their whole school education without ever seeing or touching a computer in the classroom. Schoolnet Namibia, set up in 1999 by a partnership of NGOs and the Ministry of Education, is a non-profit provider of internet, hardware and software to the nation's schools. It has a mission to ensure Namibians do not suffer from the handicap of being on the wrong side of the digital divide. Schoolnet is furnishing schools with specially designed computer labs equipped with donated computers. Often the local arms of the proprietary companies will provide their software unlicensed or at reduced cost for good causes such as Schoolnet. Yet it chose open source software for the computers now in over 400 schools. Why? In having an open source solution, the way we put it into play at schools in Namibia, as part of a very standardized system, uniformly spread out across the country, we don't have viruses, we don't have people um, vandalizing or stealing software or, or whatever it is that, that, that is probably faced in, in quite a few first world you know, environments. Schoolnet claims that the accessibility of open source also means that trainees are able to learn how to refurbish computers often with little or no knowledge of computing. Most of these people they are not satisfied. It's like when we get them they are really totally irritated from computers. Open sales help us because we are not satisfied, so it helped us to make sure that we develop ourselves. Courtesy of wireless networking, schools are getting linked to the web. In the remote areas, solar provides the power. At the computing centre at HQ in the capital, Windhoek, school children queue for up to an hour after school to use the free access to computers and the internet.
In Brazil, the pattern of usage in the home and in the private sector is little different from anywhere else in the globe. But the switch in the governmental sector is on an altogether bigger scale. A major company such as Intel has begun to adjust its strategy. Intel has been very active in free and open source software, mainly driven by what our customer demand has been. We see this predominantly in the emerging geographies in areas like India, China, Brazil. Each of these have chosen positions around open source and education, and we've been working hard to optimize our platforms for specific solutions based on open source. The Brazilian position on software and free software is very positive. The Brazilian government is, has created a program to support free software both inside the government as, a, as, a, as an application for uh, governmental procedures and also supporting free software as a tool, as an instrument for the society. By adopting open source or software libre as it's known in Brazil, the National Institute for Information Technology claims it's made a saving of around $150 million a year in license fees. And according to Gilberto Gil, this saving has been translated into more hardware reaching many previously technologically impoverished areas. There is even a government mandate now in Brazil that states that free open source software must be the software of preference by all administrative bodies. Microsoft announced the launch recently in Brazil of a simpler to operate and cheaper version of Windows XP. Is this because it's fearful that Brazil will set a very costly, for Microsoft, trend? Brazil is a very important country in the world. It's, we actually have a very focused strategy within the, the, our company around what we call the BRIC countries, so Brazil, Russia, India and China. And all of those are countries that have a wide diversity of needs. There's a very poor population in Brazil that needs access to technology, that needs to be able to get skills training to become part of the growing economy to get that first rung on the ladder. And we're very active in Brazil, working in the education sector, partnering with the government, partnering with the NGO community to make sure that that access is available. We've invested $13 million in just the last few years to provide access to technology in Brazil. But this hasn't stopped FOSS gaining a significant presence in Brazil. Projects include Paraná State's 200 million World Bank supported project that aims to provide computing infrastructure as well as delivering software content and support tools to 2,100 public schools. 40,000 computers have recently been delivered to distribution centers destined for the new school computer labs that will be running a specially developed web portal which gives access to learning tools through a two-way gateway where teachers log in and contribute to the pool of educational resources so software isn't the only thing that's being shared. I think the freedom is the, the most important thing because you can use, you can uh, uh, make some modifications and uh, any person can use these modifications. So. Uh, we live today in a, in a, in a kind of society with which, one, which uh, the, the knowledge is for everybody, and not for our little groups who have money to pay uh, for information.